So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Cooper Union Alumni Association, the CUAA, as we present Growing Up Ugly, featuring James Haywood Rowling Jr., Art 88. My name is Mark Vasquez, for those of you who don't know me. I am the CUAA Events Committee Chair, and I will be serving as your host for tonight's installment in the CUAA Alumni Showcase event series. Uh, before I introduce James, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping tips for you all. Um, number one, uh, I ask that you all remain on mute and with your cameras off uh, for the duration of the event. Uh, that way uh, we'll prevent any disruptions while James is presenting. We will have some Q&A later in the hour after James is done uh, giving his talk. Uh, and at that time, I will ask those of you who have questions to post those questions in chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in your video layout settings, just in terms of optimizing your uh, experience, you may wish to choose the view that presents the active speaker, which is the icon in the middle, um, so that you can just focus on James when he speaks, or the option with no camera view at all. And you may also wish to go full screen. That way you can make sure that you're seeing all of James's uh, slides and that you will not have the distraction of having uh, multiple camera boxes on your screen. Uh, in essence, don't, don't choose the gallery option. That's the worst option you can choose for the evening. Uh, we are also recording this and we will post it online in the near future. So with that, let me introduce James first and then I'll give him the floor. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, on James. Uh, Dr. James Haber Rowling Jr. is a dual professor of art education and teaching, uh, sorry, arts education and teaching and leadership in Syracuse University's College of Visual and Performing Arts, VPA, and School of Education. He has served as chair of the university's arts education program since 2007 and is also an affiliated faculty member in the African American in African American studies. Um, from 2018 to 2020, James was appointed to serve as the inaugural director of diversity, equity and inclusion for VPA. At the start of 2021, uh, James added two new roles to his ever growing gauntlet of creative leadership responsibilities uh, as the new co-director of the Lender Center for Social Justice at Syracuse University and as a new member of the Board of Trustees at the Everson Museum of Art. Additionally, in March, 2021, he began his elected term of office as the 37th president of the National Art Education Association, the NAEA. Over the past two years, James has championed the cause of achieving greater diversity throughout the visual arts fields as the inaugural chair of the NEAE Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Commission overseeing the work of 11 commissioners from around the nation representing various arts and museum educated related fields. James graduated from the Cooper Union School of Art in 1988 and is currently a member of the CUAA Alumni Council. Uh, he is the author of several books, including Swarm Intelligence, What Nature Teaches Us About Shaping Creative Leadership, uh, The Art Space Research Primer, Cinderella's Story, a scholarly sketchbook about race, identity, Barack Obama, the human spirit, and other stuff that matters, and Come Look With Me, Discovering African American Art for Children. Tonight, James is here to speak about his latest book, this one here, Growing Up Ugly, Memoirs of a Black Boy Daydreaming. This inspirational coming-of-age narrative traces his emergence as a painfully shy child raised, uh, raised in a struggling inner-city New York neighborhood who learned to rewrite the trajectory of his life story through, through the development of his own creative superpowers. Tonight's event, uh, for those of you who are not aware, is accompanied by a book sale fundraiser for the Cooper Union. Um, I'm put a link in there. Um, for a limited time, James is offering a copy of Growing Up Ugly as a premium for anyone who makes a donation at one of three special price points that includes a tax deductible gift in support of the Saturday program or the annual fund. Uh, to make a donation and receive your copy, uh, visit the fundraiser link, which I am currently putting in chat. Uh, you can go directly there. It is a bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash rolling fundraiser. Okay. So with that, I will give the floor to James. Welcome, James Haber Rolling Jr. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Mark. And I appreciate the, uh, the warmth with which you've welcomed me. Um, and I, uh, I, I'm going to acknowledge the audience. I know oftentimes with these kinds of events, uh, the audiences vary in size. I love the fact that um, uh, uh, this uh, talk, though, will, is being recorded and will live on a bit so that we can continue uh, 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 getting the word out uh, about the fundraiser and about the, uh, 
the book that I'm about to talk about this evening. So uh, it's always apt to start with um, some thanks. Um, and I do thank not just my friend Mark, Mark Vasquez, uh, but also Jennifer Durst, um, Anna Cavada, the Office of uh, Alumni Affairs and Development at the Cooper Union. Um, and of course, the uh, Cooper Union Alumni Association, because this is a very unique opportunity to extend the audience for this new book, um, but also to support my undergraduate alma mater um, as a member of CUAA. So uh, I'll also say, and I'm gonna rack up the slide deck in, in just a second, um, but this, I think this evening's event is appropriate. And I also find it really serendipitous because I didn't seek to have it happen. It just happened. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important to me because without the Cooper Union, and I, I, you'll see me or hear me saying this throughout the evening, I would never have developed my own creative potential. Um, I would never have become a New York City elementary school art teacher. I would not be the current chair of arts education at uh, Syracuse University. I would not have been elected 37th president of the National Art Education Association. And this is a role that actually I just stepped in to about a month ago, um, uh, which is just a few months after the publication of uh, Growing Up Ugly. So let me uh, share my screen. Um, so I'll say that uh, uh, in the early pages of the book, um, Growing Up Ugly, uh, Memoirs of a Black Boy Daydreaming, um, I, I include this uh, dedication, uh, I present these words, uh, that this book is dedicated to anyone searching for their creative superpower. And I wanna say right off the bat that this is not an abstract pursuit. It's not a metaphor. Identifying and supporting other active creatives or even just helping others to locate their creative potential in their own DNA um, has always involved active search and location, feet on the ground. In my case, getting my hands dirty uh, with the nitty gritty, I guess I could call it good trouble of serving as a New York City art teacher. Um, looking back, almost my entire career, professional career has been as a creativity educator at one level or another. Uh, uh, elementary school, working with uh, in middle school settings, uh, ultimately at this point um, as a teacher educator working in higher education. Um, but all, I know throughout all that time, I, I've been practicing the art of searching out others with uh, latent creative superpowers like my own. I'm gonna use that framework. Uh, you'll hear me talk about it and there's a reason why, which should become obvious once I start talking about um, growing up uh, in the household of a comics collector. Uh, but uh, this all started as a Saturday program instructor at the Cooper Union. And like Professor Charles Xavier, who's depicted in this slide, who perfected the art of searching for others like himself through the invention of his cerebro apparatus. Through this talk and with the help of other Cooper alumni, because I hope you'll join me in the effort to help the book find its audience, I'm looking to use this book as a tool to help locate and develop two kinds of creators. Creators, Because here's the thing, some creative superpowers you're born with and discover, like one of the X-Men in the Marvel Comics universe. Other creative superpowers originate from, from an aesthetic encounter or an instructional experience or experience with a mentor or with a material that irreversibly changes that individual, like Peter Parker being bitten by a radioactive spider and becoming Spider-Man. As far as my story is concerned, um, I it's pretty evident that I was born with some uh, pretty uh, clear visual creative abilities. I grew up at uh, 1260 Lincoln Place in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. I grew up as the firstborn son and the namesake of uh, a professional artist, graphic designer, topographer, illustrator, and art director also named, obviously, James Edward Rowling. I grew up in a house that had an art studio at the center of it. Uh, so when I was a child, I discovered early on that I was a part of a, a swarm of individuals who drew pictures and told stories of um, the worlds that were in their imaginations. And I learned how to read 
the the secret society's creative codes and I learned how to recode the record them as my own and that's how i first discovered my that was a part of this affiliation this uh of other of other artists of other creators um part of this discovery was uh came just by digging in my father's closets um, he used to keep these black trash bags full of marvel and dc comics um with everything from early uh tale you know, superhero tales to tales from the crypt and everything in, in between. Um, going through not only those garbage bags of comics, but also through my father's visual arts um, library, um, I learned about uh, the other visual codes and written codes that uh, other artists used. Uh, artists ranging from Charles Schultz, the creative peanuts, to the much darker work of Charles Adams and Edward Gorey, um, to obscure illustra illustrators that I don't know the names of, but um, the father would keep these books with um, pulp advertisements and girly drawings from the 1950s and countercultural 1960s Americana, um, and a lot of other stuff, right? Um, and within, uh, by using my father's art supplies and his resource library, um, with all of that at, at my disposal and so much content to draw on, I routinely made unexpected connections. So much so that um, uh, very early on, you know, my father noticing that I had uh, traits similar to his in terms of uh, my powers of visual observation, uh, he uh, noticed that I had this tendency to see patterns and, and see phenomenon that others uh, typically overlooked. And he did this portrait of me as a child, um, sort of emphasizing the kinds of connections that were always going on in my thinking. Um, that's depicted as that sort of labyrinth of 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 uh, connections happening in my head, so to speak. Um, and to my mind, uh, it always connected with some of the things I would see in uh, one of my favorite characters was always Snoopy. Um, and that labyrinth of a doghouse of his, which was not which was much more than it seemed to be, right, in terms of what was hidden within it and the connections and the vaults and sub basements that were in Snoopy's doghouse. So. Um, uh, that's the, I would say, the origin of my visual um, creative abilities or superpowers. But regarding my abilities as a writer and as a teacher, believe it or not, I was bitten right here. I say, I say right here, it's virtually, but right, right here at the Cooper Union. Um, I, uh, and and the, 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 the bites came in two different ways. So uh, around 1985, I became a transfer student from the School of Architecture at Cooper to the School of Art. And I began to flourish. And frankly, I began to feel alive again. And around that time, I took two semesters in a row of um, calligraphy um, instructed by um, a really brilliant professor named Donald Kuntz. I also took two semesters in a row of creative writing by an equally brilliant uh, professor named Brian Swan. As, as a matter of fact, at the time, I started writing poetry and submitting collections to annual university uh, and college poetry prize competitions. And actually only Brian Swan, only Professor Swan knew that I was doing this because eligibility required a faculty sponsor. So in essence, along with uh, three semesters of photography, uh, printmaking, advanced drawing, I had unofficially added creative writing as a minor. And it's been a lifelong creative practice ever since then. Um, even though I did start writing when I was in high school, uh, but it became official that I, I considered myself a writer by the time I was working on my BFA. Now, this is a photo in this slide of me on the sixth floor of the Cooper Union. Um, around this time, I, I, was, I was completing my BFA. I was honored to win the Cooper Union Alumni Association Award for service to the school uh, uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this period was documented in a two-page article I was interviewed for, uh, just like uh, Mark, uh, for a, the 1988-1989 Cooper Union Annual Report. Uh, behind me in this photograph is a colored pencil and oil pastel portrait that I drew titled Gemstone, which won the National Arts Club Award of Distinction in 1988. And uh, I'm still a portrait artist today. Uh, I, I was, did my MFA after leaving Cooper Union at the Syracuse University. Um, and I moved into the realm of mixed media portraiture. Um, but um, portraiture has always been with me. 
Um, and it takes a real investment uh, to bring the life, uh, uh, bring another person's life to life, so to speak, on a piece of canvas or a museum board. And I say that in to relate it to the next bite, right? So um, when I was, um, uh, um, let's say, between 1986, 1988, I started teaching 3D design and sculpture. Um, I did it for two years in a row uh, to local youngsters attending uh, uh, Cooper's Saturday Art and Architecture Program for New York City public high school students. Um, obviously, I knew I could make art. Um, I knew it quite well. I had grown up creating art as the son of a professional artist. And so I knew what that aha moment looked like and felt like intimately. Yet I, I will say, I will confess that I was never more moved than when I saw that aha moment reflected in the eyes of, and the ideas of my Saturday program students over and over and over again. Those years as a Saturday program instructor uh, actually marked the earliest point, at which I began to understand that for me, it wasn't enough to be identified as an artist, uh, you know, alone in my studio figuring out what to do next. I was actually, totally compelled uh, to become an art educator because of the notion of being a catalyst for other people's creativity coming into being, um, exploding into existence, so to speak, uh, watching them shape shift and reinterpret who they were and what they could do it was just fascinating. And because of this revelation, um, I actually sought after my BFA and my MFA to to continue my education um, as an educator. So I, as I said, I did my, I finished my BFA um, at Cooper, went on to do my MFA on a full fellowship at Syracuse University. Um, but then I went on to earn two more degrees, uh, this time in art education at Teachers College, Columbia University. New York is my hometown after all. Um, so it uh, came to pass that um, after, my, uh, after my Saturday program uh, teaching experience, I eventually became a teacher of creativity. I always call art educators creativity teachers. Um, and I had my own elementary school art classroom. Uh, eventually I went on to become, uh, as I am now currently, a teacher educator as the chair of arts education at uh, SU, Syracuse University, where I train others to become art teachers. Um, I became the senior editor of Art Education Journal and uh, which you see a, a, a copy of an issue um, on the screen right now. And ultimately uh, the president of the National Art Education Association, which is the largest membership organization for everything from, from elementary, middle school, high school, uh, uh, art educators, museum educators, teaching artists, um, uh, includes our therapists, includes our supervisors, includes the, it's the umbrella organization for all the national arts honor societies in the nation. Um, and that all started, that all started because I was a Cooper Union Saturday program instructor. So um, that's a little bit of the background. And I'm gonna dive now into a little discussion about the book itself. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna leave stuff, I'm gonna leave some, some things to, uh, to the imagination. I'm not gonna tell you what you're gonna read yourself. <laughs> so, but, uh, but I'll tell you a few things, which I think will help you understand um, the premise of the book. And I will say that um, the book was, I, uh, Mark mentioned that I've, I've written several, um, and I'm working on another project right now called The Next Creative Leap. But this particular book was uh, personal. Um, and it came about because I was working at a, a church here in the Syracuse area at a vacation Bible school we're doing some street um, uh, ministry. Um, and I, um, you ever see at uh, carnivals or, or, or um, state fairs, people doing caricatures? Well, I, I've had a practice, it's, a, it's time consuming and it, it drains you after you spend the whole day doing it, but I do street portraits. Um, I was doing street portraits of the kids. And ultimately uh, the founder of the church that I was at uh, suggested that I you know, he knew something of my story, my background, that there was something in it, um, as I was mentioning, how similar the kids in Syracuse reminded me, and the neighborhood we were working reminded me of the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, that, um, that there was there's something to be conveyed in the story and what I've lived 
and grown through uh, and conveying that story to other youngsters, there was something there and it, it stuck with me. And I started writing it, but I couldn't find the, the angle the where I wanted to go with it. And ultimately it came to me, but it took a long time. Um, and, uh, um, and where I want to go now is just what I want to give you a sense about why did I title it Growing Up Ugly? So in chapter one, um, I reflect on the source of my childhood belief that I was born ugly and why others like me, others who discover for whatever reason that they're viewed as different or as ill-fitted or as out of place, are actually often blessed with a perspective and a set of abilities that we simply have not yet fully figured out. Uh, but I confess that um, on the way to discovering that my early conceptions of myself were flawed, um, I gathered many wounds. Um, and some of those injuries were as a result of parenting choices. Um, some were as a result of being vulnerable to bullies, um, as I was very vulnerable. Um, sometimes it was a result of uh, indifferent or negligent schooling, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. And sometimes it was a result of growing up in a society where it makes it clear every single day that the lives of young Black boys don't matter very much. Um, sometimes my injuries were the result of all of those, all the, of the above, all at once. Um, Whatever the case, I was precocious. <laughs> I was very precocious, and I was preco precocious enough to recognize that there was very little that was desirable about me, to my mind. And so I helped other folks out by hiding in plain sight. Um, and by the end of the first chapter of this book and of my life, I made the very unchildlike decision to bottle up all of my public displays of emotion. And this is not an exaggeration. I literally tried to make myself disappear every day believing I would not be missed. Now for the remainder of the book, um, and you can see here some of the chapter titles, um, uh, I weave together prose and poetry, um, found documents, I did a lot of research, um, family photos, and some imagery that I created. As a matter of fact, I did the cover image, um, cover design. Um, I weave out that all together to create a self-portrait, essentially, um, as I searched out the sources of my African-American and West Indian lineages, which both converged in the neighborhood of Crown Heights, Brooklyn, um, to revisit my upbringing as the firstborn son of a very talented professional artist, but also a very domineering father. Um, I used the rest of the book to explore the unexpected personal consequences of being bused to a school daily from a neighborhood that had experienced white flight and had become a ghetto as a result. Um, and being bused over to a mostly white neighborhood, um, the neighborhood of Sheepshead Bay, way on the other side of Brooklyn. Uh, I also uh, go through um, explaining, because sometimes it's hard to, to see how this can be a detriment, but how being identified and tracked throughout elementary school and middle school as a gifted student, uh, including skipping seventh grade, actually contributed to a really dangerously distorted view of my own capabilities until God intervened. Ultimately, my storytelling is intended to elevate its readers beyond their own trauma, uh, their own social anxiety or self-doubt. Uh, I consider it a book that's for um, anyone who's ever been underestimated, bullied, abused, or simply overlooked as you or someone you care about reimagines a pathway from daydreams to destiny. Now, to close out this presentation, um, I want to talk a little bit about daydreaming, which is the other, which is the part of the subtitle, right? Memoirs of a Black Boy Daydreaming. Um, my uh, the book starts out from a position of ugliness, but it concludes with the very open-ended possibilities that come from daydreaming. Whereas the book's epilogue is titled, you see that on your screen, drawing superheroes on blank pages. Was, uh, ultimately, I learned that daydreamers are not ugly. They're far from it. Daydreamers are powerful. We are creators. Like, Harold and his purple crayon, for those of you who are up with your children's books, or as generative as Snoopy and his, what I like to think of as a wizarding emporium of a doghouse that he had that always had exactly what it was needed, waiting to be pulled out of it, even if it didn't seem like it could possibly fit within that doghouse. Yet as I was growing up, the truth was that I was regularly reprimanded for my daydreaming. 
um, given that I often appeared apparently to my teachers to be more interested in imagining what was happening just beyond the nearest classroom window than paying attention to what was happening inside. But here's the thing, I was always paying attention. Um, I was never not paying attention. I was never not listening. Rather, um, uh, I, I would, uh, to help you understand it, to me, daydreaming is like a superpower. Uh, I was actually absorbing what was, I was hearing and seeing right in front of me. And I was converting it in, in real time, like a, like a stargate into other possibilities, other identities, other worlds. And that all was being fueled by everything I was taking in. Um, so this is a, the last couple of slides here. This is a, this is Zoe. I used to teach Zoe when she was in fourth grade at the new elementary school at Columbia University that was still a hole in the ground when I was first hired as one of its inaugural fa faculty members. And like uh, my current students at Syracuse University, I used to instruct my kids to think in terms of what ifs and why nots, and then create stories about those daydreams and ideas. Now in this particular drawing that you see on the screen, she imagines herself as a National Geographic deep sea diver, exploring the unknown, collecting scientific samples from the ocean floor where no woman has gone before. However, it was Zoe's art that carried her over to the place where her daydreams uh, were depicted, which makes them possible. You can see them, right? One of the main purposes of our art and design, I've argued for years, is to organize what we know and what we imagine so that we can grow and engineer. And this is how daydreams are converted by our creative activities into destinies. Uh, so uh, I thought uh, in terms of the, uh, the last slide here um, and the last moments of this presentation before I get to the Q&A, um, I wanted to read an excerpt from the early chapters of Growing Up Ugly um, that gets at this notion of daydreaming. Um, you know, this notion of a wounded boy who voraciously read about ants and bees. That's me in a hallway in my, at 1260 Lincoln Place. And then grew up to be a daydreamer and a teacher of other daydreamers. So here's the excerpt. Um, from the summer after first grade through the remainder of my elementary schooling, my love of books continued to fill the voids left by my interpersonal detachments. Contradicting the popular stereotypes that rendered me either flat, dull, and stupid, or a dangerous additive to neighborhoods like Sheepshead Bay, I was a regular in the school library, reading about dolphins and panthers and saber-toothed tigers, Encyclopedia Brown, the, the boy detective, and science fiction adventurer Danny Dunn. But books weren't my only fuel for my earliest creative leaps, or the sights to be seen on my way to school each morning. Through my rattling school bus window, I watched the theatrical display of architectural transitions parade from stage left to stage right, from the dingy familiarity of the apartment buildings in Crown Heights to the vividness of neighborhoods over which I claimed ownership by right of painstaking observation. Day by day, I cataloged freestanding homes that strangely did not share each other's walls, homes surrounded either by front yards or backyards or whole plots of land, often accented with above ground swimming, swimming pools painted blue sporting driveways and carports addressing two car garages. There were two story Mike and his Brady Bunch structures with jutting rooftops and parental Norway maples and London plane trees hugging their eaves in affectionate greenery. There were oak trees with, ropes, with rope swings lashed to their boughs, some with tree houses swaddled in their branches. As our yellow school bus entered these neighborhoods, I liked to unlatch the window beside my seats so that it slapped down a few notches I could breathe in the aromas of passing trees, tucking me back into my seat with a blanket of fresh oxygen that soothed all of my asthmas. And the holidays, there were great peeling tree, uh, trunks of trees far into Lincoln Place, dumping bark and color and thick color onto lawns like generously Charles Schultz Sunday Peanuts comic panels come to life. I would imagine Schroeder's fingers racing on the keyboards, playing jazz riffs for Charlie Brown's other friends to dance to. I saw jack-o'-lanterns and other orange and brown paraphernalia nailed to doorways, skeletons lashed to fences, ghosts along the rooftop overhangs, paper turkeys and pilgrims on porches, on porches, twisted gourds and copious woven baskets stacked with dry airs with multicolored kernel corn. 
And in the final months of the year, I committed to memory street after street of white unstained snow with strings of light taut against early winter light, wrapping roofs and windows with competing displays of dispensable income, the reddish glows of countless plastic Santa Clauses and blinking reindeer noses marching around and above those unapproachable houses. I committed these sites to memory, not knowing I would write about them dec decades later. I needed to remember that there were alternatives to 1260 Lincoln Place. On pleasantly chilled fall afternoons, when we were allowed outside at lunchtime for recess in snug bubble jackets and thickening sweaters, even while other kids shrieked and laughed and dodged and ran, my mind would begin to drift elsewhere in daydream. After I, I had eaten, I would often lay my Scooby-Doo lunchbox down beside the tall fence to further inspect the area through my small black rim glasses, roaming up and down the schoolyard's perimeter with my fingertips skipping slowly against the cold metal links. I crunched my way through drying layers of leaves that were still changing color, even as they had dropped to the ground. And it would often occur to me to select from among the fat acorns and the biggest of the and the best of the fallen leaves carpeted across my exploring feet. And with great care, I would tear and pinch and fold back the pointed lobes of my favorites of all the leaves I'd collected. And when I had finally shaped my finest fleet of spaceships, I would launch myself from beneath the shelter of high oak trees to conquer blue worlds of my own creation. And with that, um, I am gonna close and I wanna thank you all for your attention and uh, for contributing a donation and support of uh, the Cooper Union Saturday program uh, or the annual fund. Please help me in joining this book, uh, join, uh, join me in helping this book find its way into the hands of others who are also in search of their own creative superpowers. And I'll stop there. I'm gonna stop share. And I'll turn it up back over to Mark if he's there. I am. Thank you so much, James. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure I echo what uh, what most are are thinking. In that, um, yeah, there there was somebody I should mention. There was someone who I was speaking with recently who said they were looking forward to this event mm -hmm. uh, because for themselves they they um, they they found it difficult to be able to express themselves openly and vulnerably and to see somebody a fellow alum who was able to do this in a very sort of public way mm -hmm. um they thought was very inspiring so i know we have at least one you know more, more people online who who share that sentiment mm -hmm. um for those of you who are online um please feel free to drop a question in chat if you haven't already done so we'll get to as many of those questions as we can um i'll start you off with a question though james sure in reading the the preface to the book one of the things that you mentioned was that in some ways, the the concept behind the book really came about about a decade ago, mm -hmm. um, and I was curious to know from you. Uh, so why now? Why why was now the right time to to publish this and to write this after sort of ten years of maybe thinking about it? Yeah, thank the great question. Um, because I've often asked myself, why did it take so long? <laughs> um, so um, for me, I. I uh, so oftentimes call myself a former perfectionist who doesn't try quite so hard any, any longer. Um, and for me, um, I, it wasn't just an effort to, um, you know, tell a, a particular story. It was uh, an effort, and I've shared and sharing it with, with folks who, are, who, who I know love me and who, who I trust um, to get their sense of my really being as revealing as I need to be. Um, and you get at something in what you just said there, because um, I think I've always been motivated by uh, maybe more than more than anything uh, by working with and serving and supporting, ministering to um, what I like to call broken lambs, um, uh, folks who have been wounded. I you know what that remember? Uh, I think it was in Rudolph the Red, Red Nosed Reindeer, that island of misfit toys. Yeah. Um, and you see a little bit of it in the in the recent Toy Story movies as well. There's something to be said about the, the fact that uh, many of us carry wounds um, and carry injuries, and um, and they can stunt and they can stop. And I've seen it as a as an elementary school teacher, uh, and I've seen you can actually interesting interestingly see the uh, almost like a stall in the artistic development 
at the part the point in their life when they got injured um and you can uh, because there was a there was a uh, you know there is a there's a, tra a trajectory to artistic development um uh and when you identify the fact that you want to reach folks who have been similarly injured or or stunted or stalled or stuck um then you have to really get at um exposing yourself um uh, exposing making yourself vulnerable uh in a way that speaks and that reaches and so it took a long time before i was able to really open up entirely to all the stories that i needed to tell um so for that reason um i think it took longer to get to, to get to where i needed to go to really make the book as effective as it could for the long run right as opposed to simply being a uh, you know just a you know, an exercise in telling my own story, I really wanted to find a connection to other people's stories. And that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're writing in isolation of the other people who are the, the audience that you're writing to. Uh, there's a lot of intuition that goes into it, a lot of uh, um, is, you know, sensing it out, feeling it out until it feels right. And then of course you roll, you wrote it in front, put it in front of other eyes and say, what, what do you think of this? Is it speaking to you? So. Um, so it just took longer than I expected. Uh, and so now, why now, to uh, a long about way of answering your question, uh, I finally got to the place where I could be as vulnerable as I needed to be. And also, um, we are in the middle of a crisis in our uh, world, an existential crisis, which um, had folks feeling extremely vulnerable in lots of different ways. And, I, and, I, and I'll wind this up by saying that because of my investment in speaking to certain audiences that have um, been uh, shunted aside, overlooked, bullied, um, uh, uh, injured, traumatized. Uh, this is a time when everyone's feeling that sense of trauma um, in lots of different ways. Um, and it, it it occurred to me that if not now, what's the better time? Right, and so that's why I, I this, okay, it's this is it. I, you know, I finally got this is it. I've got to, I've got to put it out now. And so it came out, published it on December twenty eighth, uh, my birthday actually. Um, that's the answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you you were you were waiting for your your birthday in twenty twenty to. That's, 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 yeah. You could look at it that way. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a way of saying, okay, uh, we're, I'm still here still yeah. here and uh connecting with the folks who are still here you know yeah. wherever they are and uh it's funny because you mentioned um not, not funny but it's interesting that you mentioned um trying to find sharing your story in a way that you hoped would um connect with similar stories that others mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. and it's it's funny you mentioned that because i so I just received my copy today. I haven't read the book in its entirety, but mm -hmm. I had a chance to, um, to skim through it a bit. And um, two of the very first sections that I randomly popped open to were sections that um, were, were very similar to my own experience. So it's mm -hmm. funny you should mention that about trying to find that connection. Yeah. And I tagged them because I, I wanted to read them. Sure. Um, the first part, and they're, they're directly related. Mm -hmm. The first part is the, the opening paragraph of chapter nine. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, while I was attending Shell Bank Junior High School in Sheepshead Bay, um, the school district determined that I should skip seventh grade and my parents apparently agreed. Consistently outscoring classmates on reading and math grade level assessments at the school I attended, I don't recall that I was given a choice. At the time, skipping a grade and getting out of junior high school faster probably sounded like a neat idea to me. In retrospect, moving any child out of his or her schooling age group is an awful idea, especially for one like me who was already a social misfit. And then there's a piece later on um, in, let's see, what chapter is this? This is chapter 10, the very next chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, this is now, you're, you're a Cooper now, you're in the School of Architecture, and you mentioned uh, in my second year, I was receiving C's in my architecture major. Mm -hmm. By my third year, I was given an F in my architectural studio section. I was absolutely stunned. I had never failed a class before. Absolutely. I was sometimes in courses with students who were returning to college for the second time to change their careers. So as the youngest person in my freshman class, I typically remained invisible to most of my peers, well outside of their social circles and alone in my struggles. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because those two paragraphs and, and we've known each other, we, we went to school together. We, for those of you who don't know, James and I were in the same year. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that was my experience as well in both cases, right? Yeah. You know, I, I was skipped twice, as you know, and, um, and I also went through a period at Cooper in my first year where I was failing out of courses. So both yeah. of those events were 
you know, you talk about moments and trajectories that change people. Yeah. Um, and those are both points that, that changed me. And, and, and that in some ways I'm still sort of recovering from. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, one of the first, first I wanted to mention, um, you know, again, commend you on being so vulnerable. Um, my, my question to you, for those of you, for those who are listening, for those who might watch this back, for those who might have children, um, in the same case, you, you specifically mentioned how that, that process of skipping students was a really challenging one. I, I personally feel the same way. Um, mm -hmm. I've given people my own uh, advice on that. When they come <laughs> out, you, know? Um, yeah. you know, from the academic standpoint, that's one thing, but from a social standpoint, that's an entirely different experience that one needs to consider. Um, yeah. I assume that you're of the opinion that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume you're of the opinion that from an educational standpoint, uh, it's it's more beneficial to find alternate ways to challenge students academically other than skipping them and putting them in a completely different demographic socially. Yeah. Is that is that sure. accurate? Yeah, uh, that's very accurate. You know, the, the one of the diff one of the problems with education at the time that I was being educated in K through twelve, uh, the K through twelve setting is that they didn't ask you <laughs> permission about anything. They just told right. you, they just tracked you. As a matter of fact, I discovered at, way after the fact, years after the fact, that I was being tracked throughout elementary school in terms of like um, these top classes, and it was probably because I, I went to pre kindergarten. I had a, a really, you know, robust reading level coming into, you know, kindergarten coming to first grade. And I never lost that momentum. I never lost that advantage, so to speak. My parents, you know, did the flashcards thing. They, they had that idea. So the point though, is that um, uh, I, there was, no, the, school was a, uh, was a place where the, I was never gonna be bored. I was never gonna be not challenged. Um, the idea of skipping me um, and sort of taking me out of my friendship circle and putting me into another grade where nobody, I knew nobody and I was already a wallflower, shrinking violet, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it just exacerbated the entire um, social disconnect. Um, and that is something that I never really recovered from. Um, you know, I just withdrew even further and it took me a while. And I say I never recovered from it. Obviously I'm an educator, I'm a public speaker. I've gotten there, but the, the, the ramifications um, were really injurious. Uh, and um, as an educator and as someone who's taught in an elementary school setting, I know very well that there are hundreds of ways you can challenge a child without skipping them out of a, of a grade. They, they, I mean, you, you know, as a matter of fact, one of the, one of the, one of the more important things that ever happened to me in elementary school was an, a first grade teacher who recognized that I had a love for reading and um, just gave me the a gift of books to read over the summer. And her take, give me a gift and say, just take these out of the library. These are yours. Read them over the summer. That changed me, you know, because she cared. She reached out to me at a time when I was, you know, still trying to figure out what's this whole busing thing about? Why does nobody want to play with me? What, you know, you know, why did the teachers seem like I'm a, like a, like a, keep me hands off? Because I didn't understand the whole race thing yet. You know, it was first grade. Um, but she recognized I needed to, that touch. Um, and there are things, there are ways you can touch kids and, and, and affect their lives and, and positively, but that is not the way to do it. So right. I, I'm an advocate for not skipping grades. So um, I, I, I have a follow-up to that that somebody asked yeah. here. Um, it wasn't necessarily a follow-up to your question, but it, um, yeah. uh, it's related. But I, I, would, I wanted to respond to somebody in chat who asked about how to go about ordering copies of the book. Um, oh, they, sure. they, they logged on late. I just want to let everybody know that I'm I'm a uh, I've just put in chat a, a link to the page for the fundraiser where you can order a copy of James's book. Um, so for whoever asked that question, if you go to that link, you'll get all the information you need to, to order the book. Um, <clears throat> the follow up or the related question I had for you, James, mm -hmm. um, was from Carla Alvarez. I'm just scrolling through uh, here. Carla. Yes, Carla Alvarez. Um, Hi, Carla. Okay, hold on. I'm just I'm scrolling through here because I saw a question that was related that I want to make sure. Here we go. Mm -hmm. um, she says, "Thank you for being so brave to put your own story out and reaching out to others. What are your thoughts on guiding youngsters that may also have superpowers that they may not realize, understand, and or downplay in themselves?" Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do we enable that in in our um, in our in our younger generation? I think uh, you know. For me, it's almost like an obvious thing. And maybe it's because I I, I was there, um, and maybe and I, and I don't I don't mean that to diminish the question, um, but for for the one who needs to be reached, 
um, being identified and recognized is the first step because more often than not, the struggle is that, um, uh, I mean, there's different reasons why folks downplay. Um, sometimes it's because uh, uh, they don't wanna be identified. Um, they don't wanna stand out. They don't wanna be, um, um, you know, they don't wanna be uh, set aside from the crowd. They wanna stay where they are, going back to that notion of not skipping a grade, so to speak. Right. Um, and, and that's a real thing. But oftentimes, um, folks have been burned um, or are wounded by people's reaction to their being slightly different or being not like everyone else. Um, and if you identify that superpower, I'm just going to call it that, uh, and you recognize it as something that is not a stigma, not a, uh, uh, a red mark, um, but something that is a power, that is a creative power um, that, is, that, 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 that opens up, that can't open up doors for them and talk with them and mentor them based on your own um, having lived through that yourself and, or seen it in others. Um, that's, that's the opening that's necessary because oftentimes they don't know how others are going to react to this thing they have. And, and you know, if, if we're, the one thing I do really always appreciate by the efforts of, of, um, of uh, writers like Stan Lee and the and the crew at Marvels in terms of like talking about the X Men, they've actually made an actually decent effort to talk about that sense of um, being the misfit uh, and and how that it oftentimes because that that is allegorical that that oftentimes hides a majestic um, power. Um, so so I would say that I would start with the notion of, of that making that connection that um, uh, that this is not a bad thing. <laughs> You've got something that most people don't have. Um, and let's work on developing it. So giving them opportunities to develop it, to, to learn how to use it. Because there's always a scene in every superhero movie that comes out these days where the, the person who figures out, oh, wow, I've got these powers, has to figure out how to use it. And that figuring out process can be humorous and it can be uh, fraught with dangers. Um, uh, as they learned that uh, with great power comes great responsibility. But the point is that you have to um, give them an opportunity or an arena to actually start developing what they've got and maybe have never really focused on or have been afraid to focus on. Yeah, and, and you know, part of that I think as well is, is the, the notion of um, embracing that superpower as well, right? Just, just yeah. doing it. There was something I also tagged in your epilogue Mm -hmm. um, where you offer people a challenge and you say, you know, creativity matters, story matters. And you say, I offer you this challenge, make something from nothing, from a blank canvas, from an empty page, through the open frame of your camera lens. Um, it, it's, it's a part of it is also sort of embracing that and just kind of going for it um, and sort of bringing people along with you. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I want to ask a question. There's another related question that uh, came early on from uh, Stephen Gerard. He says, um, my grandson is eight years old and likes to draw. We have bought him a variety of pens and pencils and watercolors. Is there anything else we should consider to support him and to assess whether he really has artistic talent? Uh, my first question is how old is the grandson? But um, uh, Eight years old. About eight years old. Um, so uh, I, uh, I'll say two things. One is that the... Uh, uh, purchasing supplies and giving supplies, because I'm going back to, once again, I'm going to use this lens of, of having access, having access to supplies, having access to resources, makes a world of difference um, uh, when you have the, uh, um, the uh, things to, to experiment with. So uh, you take, uh, and I'm going to say something real quickly here, that one of the things that, um, that kids who are creative so oftentimes face is that we actually have a very narrow view of what it is to be an artist, to be a creator. Um, I have a very broad view of it. It's about being a creative being. It's not about simply making objects that are beautiful. <laughs> it's about it's about being able to make connections between things that don't that shouldn't, by all uh, account, fit together. And yet you figure out how to adapt them, assimilate them, make something from nothing. I'm going to use that phrase um, because nothing can be um, a blank canvas. Or nothing can be um, uh, James T. Kirk 
fighting the Gorn on a on a on an obsolete planet uh, 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 and figuring out that oh here's a way to make um, a weapon out of this um, chemical and that chemical and these uh, diamonds and this uh, so you know and you figure out when you had you thought you had nothing you find a way to make connections and put them together so so giving uh, the resources and making that provision is one thing giving time is another. Um, so I oftentimes, uh, well, at Syracuse University, we have a, a, uh, um, a Saturday program, similar to the one that Cooper Union for high school students, um, but this one is for kids five to 15 years old, uh, and it augments what they get in school um, when the parents send them there. Oftentimes, like I say, um, what you uh, folks get from their experiences in schooling may not be the thing that actually triggers or is the catalyst for the greatest uh, creative leap that that child um, um, has within them. Um, and sometimes it, it needs that to be that unusual material or that, that, that mentor who's not a part of their schooling, that can be the catalyst. Um, but you don't know until you try different scenarios. And so um, it becomes an opportunity, you know, you look for opportunities to, to give students a, an, an op, a, a, um, a possibility of stretching beyond what their normal is or what their current is. Um, so finding uh, more resources, giving them, letting them try it out. If it doesn't, they don't like it, try some other resources because there's so many different ways to make things. And making things is not just drawing. You know, sometimes it's building. I, I come from an architectural background, as I mentioned. Uh, I majored in architecture at the High School of Art and Design. When I was an arts, when I was an elementary school teacher, I brought architectonic ideas into the elementary school classroom because kids love building things. That was like a, that was like a duh. Right. right. So, um, so with all that said, um, I think they're on track by, by getting stuff, but you know, looking for other programs, Saturday programs, out, off school programs, that's also another way of doing, doing that, uh, catalyzing that uh, their grandson. It's funny, I often kid that I was uh, skipped very early on because I was really good with the blocks in class. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a comment here. I know we're coming up at the top of the hour, but but um, if, if people don't mind, we'll, we'll keep this going just a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a comment from Carol Wolf, and, and I think it speaks to at least our experience as Cooper Union uh, mm -hmm. alumni mm -hmm. um, in general. Uh, she said, not so much a question, but I feel very connected to what James has described. My father was a graphic designer and my mother was a writer. So I grew up in a household, a household full of art and design books and mm -hmm. was encouraged to pursue art, which I excelled at from a young age. But I always felt like a misfit everywhere. I never skipped a grade, but I never fit in. And I always assumed it was my own fault. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, I'm glad Carol said that because one of the things that's occurred to me, even before we had the conversation about the book and, and before tonight, is that when you look across sort of the landscape of Cooper, in some ways, um, we, we are um, in very many ways, the misfits, right? Yeah. We, we are those, those, those students who have excelled um, in a very particular way in our respective fields, which mm -hmm. in some ways almost makes us a misfit right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's sort of a, spec a spectrum of misfitness. I don't know if that's a word, but right. So, so there's, there, there, we're sort of all misfits just by being at Cooper. And then there's, mm -hmm. you know, the, those of us who may have had, uh, you know, interesting experiences um, like skipping and whatnot. And then there's the additional experience of, of you and I, you know, being people of color and growing up in certain neighborhoods. Um, so it's really interesting how, to me, I'm, I'm really glad Carol said that because regardless of, of our initial experiences, the fact that we were all in this place together gave us a place and others have commented that when they arrived at Cooper, they felt like they belonged somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it felt like this was, you know, you talk about the Island of Misfit Toys, right? This was, mm -hmm. this was our Island of Misfit Toys. We were in a place where we all had value. We all understood each other. We all sort of felt like um, this was a place where we were being recognized in the way you said before. Ideally, ideally. And I say right. that because, uh, unfortunately, even at we, way back then at Cooper, um, you know, uh, I, my first stint as an architecture student, I, I, I probably felt more of a misfit than I ever did ever in my life. Mm -hmm. It was when I actually transferred to the School of Art that I actually flourished. Um, I mean, really flourished. Um, and I found, uh, and even, and, you know, even, you know, we still live in a society that, that, um, that is, uh, that has a lot of institutional racism. I, I talk about certain incidents that happened while I was a Cooper student, mm -hmm. uh, either at Cooper or, or, or as a part of an excursion to a museum. Uh, while I was a Cooper student, and 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 these are things that are life changing moments. 
Um, and if you never get past that misfitness of a nation that doesn't actually fully embrace your life or and, and make it clear that your life matters as much as everyone else. So, um, but at the same time, uh, yes uh, to that notion that um, for me, I actually love the concept and the feeling of being, you know, one of my fa my favorite notions about and, and lived experiences about Cooper Union was the shop. Just for the sake, sake that there are people coming in there from engineering, people coming in there from architecture, people coming in there from the School of Art, and all making stuff in the same uh, uh, proximity, or uh, different things, watching one another, the influence, the cross discipline. And as I'll tell you that that cross disciplinarity has never left me. It started there at Cooper Union, um, the idea that I saw myself as a generalist art, art, art uh, uh, artist who studied had as much of a love for photography as I did for printmaking, as I did for drawing, as I did for calligraphy, and as I did for creative writing. And that was nurtured while I was in the School of Art. Uh, and, and it's never left me as an art educator or as a creativity educator. I included in all my college courses that sense of interdisciplinarity, finding that, that, that body of knowledge from, from across the border, um, from across, in, another, in another discipline, in another field importing it, bring it in, adapting it. Um, it. I think it's the most useful thing. So we are at the top of the hour. Um, you know, I'm sure we could go on for, for even longer. Um, my hope is that um, folks, you know, if, if they want to follow up with you, James, I, I assume, you know, there's maybe some contact info in the book or sure, something. Sure. Yeah, to you. I mean, yeah, easy, um, easy, easy, easy. I'm easy to find um, I, either uh, uh, because I'm a public, uh, I have a public email address at the Coopy, uh, sorry, at um, Syracuse University, uh, jrowling at syr.edu. I have a, uh, 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 you can contact me through the National Art Education Association. Um, just, just Google it. Um, uh, and um, uh, more importantly, uh, I'm going to emphasize: if you know anybody who this book will speak to, get it into their hands. And, I, and that, uh, that's. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, that's the purpose of writing the book. Yeah, I appreciate it. So uh, we are wrapping up. I want to remind everyone that we were recording tonight's um, event. So it will be online in the next few weeks or so. And we'll make sure that you all know about that. So you can share this with uh, with folks who might have missed it, or if you want to watch it back, if you got here late, etc. Um, a few thank yous before we um, actually no, before we get to that, I want to show you some uh, upcoming <clears throat> information. For those of you who are on, let me share my screen very quickly here for a moment. So just as a reminder to those of you um, who are on, if you are interested in the events that the CUA has been putting on, we do have another upcoming event at the end of the month. Um, it is part of our alumni excursion series. Uh, this will be our second virtual visit to Greenwood Cemetery. It's an ongoing tradition. that's been hosted by Barry Drogan, one of our fellow alum. It used to be done in person. Uh, last year, we hosted it virtually for the first time. We're doing that again this year. Um, you can register for this at the link shown here, bit.ly slash Greenwood 2021. Um, there will be additional events coming in May and June, so keep your eyes peeled for those. And you can follow us online on our website, Instagram and Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, for more information. There are also email blasts that go out, so you may get information that way. Uh, and then as a final reminder, if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, um, you can go to the link, which I'm going to put again in chat. So there it is again for everyone. Um, you know, visit the fundraiser page. Uh, it's an opportunity to both get a copy of the book, support James in, in his endeavor, and thank him for, for sharing his information as well as helping the school at the same time. So um, if you're able to do that, uh, we'd appreciate that support. So um, let me close by uh, saying a few thank yous. I want to thank the CUAA Communications Committee and, as James mentioned, the Office of Alumni Affairs and Development for their, their help. Um, not just in spreading the word, but in the case of the office and helping us to actually formulate tonight's um, event and the fundraiser aspect of it. Uh, thank you to the CUA Events Committee for their work in bringing events like this to the alumni body and the broader Cooper community. Uh, thank you to all of you who joined us this evening. Thank you for participating. We hope to see you at future events. And of course, uh, thank you again, James, for being with us tonight, for sharing your talk, uh, for sharing your book with us. And um, you know, hopefully there, there's more to come. Um, so with that, I will say thank you and good night, everyone. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, James has indicated how he can be reached and he sounds open to that. So feel free to reach out to him or you can reach out to me and I can follow up with James on, 
on your behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, I will say good evening, good night, um, be well, and stay safe, everyone. Thanks, Marcus. So I uh, appreciate everything and everyone behind the scenes. Thank you so much. Thanks for the participants as well. Take care, everyone. Okay.